Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have John Dwyer, JD, who's one of the top marketing experts and founder of the Institute of Wow. He's been called the Seinfeld guy because he scored huge by getting Jerry Seinfeld as a spokesman for a client he had in Australia. And Jerry had only done two other advertising campaigns up until then for American Express and Microsoft. JD has advised McDonald's, KFC, Westfield, and many others. And he's also worked closely with Walt Disney and Warner Brothers Entertainment Empires in Australia. He's created marketing that has generated hundreds of millions of dollars in sales for his clients. And to give you an idea of JD's campaigns that resulted in an avalanche of responses, one, only one of his marketing responses or his marketing concepts generated over 804,000 phone calls in just one week. JD, thanks for joining me. Hi, Jeremy. My pleasure. You know, since it's Inspired Insider, tell me about your lowest moment and how you pushed forward. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. 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 Um, look, I yeah. The the lowest moment that I've had. I mean, I'm pretty jovial and 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 muck about, and I'm your typical larrikin. Um, and so most of my time, I'm up. Um, in fact, Valentine's Day has just passed, and one of my good mates, um, that is, you know, he's in his fifties like I am, and he's been around a while. He has no idea, but I'm the one that's been sending him those dirty Valentine's Day cards for the last thirty years. <laughs> from the private and, ladies website oh mate look it's just amazing i mean he lives in sydney and i live on the gold coast we're an hour flight away from each other these days but uh, we grew up together and we're both larrikins and most of my friends are all stupid and um he uh he doesn't realize it but you know over the years when he would have a beer with me the, you know three days after valentine's day he'd say to me look what i got and it's the card i've sent him, of course <laughs> and uh he goes look she wants to put chocolate all over me and lick it off you know and I went, wow, boy. So if I if he ever finds out that I'm doing that, I've got to sleep with one eye open. I won't. For the rest of my I life. won't send this to him. Yeah, please. Yeah, no. He, look, he, he he's a concreter, so I don't think he'll be listening into your program. But anyway, so therefore, my life's full of um, larrikins and uh, and people who just enjoy life and have a good time. So that's pretty much my persona, and I mess around with nuts like me. Um, but yeah, there was a low time, and that was back in um, uh, the mid nineties. And what had happened is that I was producing a lot of the bubblegum trading cards here in Australia uh, for Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and Lion King and uh, Schwarzenegger movies and all that sort of stuff. And you guys in America have grown up on baseball and basketball bubblegum cards, so you yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I had taken over that industry in Australia. And wow. the reason I had is because the bubblegum company that had it before me just didn't realize how to market these trading cards. And I went backwards and forwards to your country, to the States, and learned how the baseball card phenomena worked and just brought it back for our sports here mm -hmm. in Australia. And what I did is take out the licenses for some of the big movies. Well, I was doing the Aladdin cards, and I had to fly over to see Disney and Burbank. And whilst I was away, the manager of my business made a massive printing mistake. And I won't bore you with the details, but basically he printed the cards upside down with wrong numbers and all sorts of things. They got distributed to all of the drugstores here in Australia for the kids to buy them, and we had to basically take the stock back and burn it because mm. everything was wrong. And we lost $2.2 .2 million in a week. Wow. And uh, so I had about 17 people working for me at the time, and uh, we had to cut that in half because the bank wanted to close me down. And uh, it was a pretty sad time. We lost our house and all the stuff that goes with it. And uh, a lot of entrepreneurs who are listening to this have probably been through the same thing, so I'm not the only one. Um, and I remember on one occasion when I had to take my family out of their home, and you wouldn't believe it, the day that we were leaving our home, which was a beautiful property in the country with a two-story house and a guest lodge and the little river with a canoe and tennis court, all the trappings that I had had because I'd been successful up at that point of time, we were losing that. And the day that we had to leave, would you believe, and I'll never forget it, I was driving the Tarago van with all the six kids in the back, uh, well, maybe four, I think we might have had four of the children then. I looked across at my wife and she would never say anything, but she had a tear rolling down her cheek. Oy. The day that I took her away from her home was Mother's Day. Oh, my gosh. So I felt pretty low, and uh, I remember I went into church one morning, 
Um, I'll never forget it. Uh, two little children at the time who are in their twenties now, but they were five and six or seven at the time. I was taking them to school from this rented unit that we had because we couldn't afford to have anything else. And as it turned out, um, I was running late for school and I forgot to put my seatbelt on. And the policeman pulls me up and books me for not having my seatbelt on. And I thought, well, that's terrific. We've just lost two point two million the week before. And now I'm getting fined for not having a seatbelt. I put my foot down to get them to school on time, and another policeman pulled me over for speeding that morning. <laughs> Not a good morning. We got to school and uh, there was a church next to the St. Joseph School. And I thought, well, I'll go in and have a word to the big guy upstairs because, you know, look, this has got to stop, right? <laughs> so anyway, I get to the front door and the side door, what do you think? Locked, locked. So I remember looking up and saying, I, I think I'm getting the message. They're locking right? you out. Oh, my God. Yeah. So anyway, the priest actually saw me at the side door and uh, he said to me, what can I do for you? I said, oh, mate, I'd just like to get in and steal all the money from the poor boxes, but I can't get into the church, right? Wow. And I just mentioned to him, I wanted to get in to say a prayer. And he said, uh, fine. So he opened up and uh, I went in and I just said a prayer to the big guy upstairs and just said, look, any chance at all, I don't want to be rich again. I don't want to be wealthy again. All I want is just put a roof over my kid's head and pay back my wife for this awful thing that's happened. And yeah. uh and I said, look, if that happens, I promise to pay back. Well, as it's turned out, you wouldn't believe it. Two weeks later, on the day that the bank was coming in to close the business up, because they said, you're not going to survive. I said, if I just get the rugby league trading cards, which would be like getting your NBL license for the trading card. If I can just get the N uh, the, uh, the um, rugby league trading, I'll get all the money back in a year, I know. And uh, I pitched for the rugby league trading license with about six other companies. On the day that we were due to be closed up by the bank, I get a phone call from the rugby league. And the guy, Graham Clark, his name is, he said, listen, now keep in mind, I'd been at him and at him and at him because I knew this was my lifeline. And he must have got a thousand calls from me the two or three weeks beforehand. He rings me and he says, JD. And I said, yep, I'm trembling, of course, because I know today's D-Day. He said, you've got the rugby league trading card license. Wow. And I went, oh, oh, thank you, thank you. And he said, but on one condition. I went, anything, anything. He said, you never bloody ring me again for the rest of your life. He said, you are the most annoying rat that I've ever come across. <laughs> I said, it's a deal. It's a deal. Wow. So we got the license. Uh, I knew how to market these things. I went to Rupert Murdoch's papers here in Australia and said, listen, how about I give you millions of football cards, trading cards to hand out on a Sunday paper? And that's what he did. And if they didn't find Elvis, the front page of the newspaper said, get your free trading cards for the football players in today's paper. All the kids would get their first two or three cards, taste test it, run into the drugstore and buy my $2 packs. We took the rugby league trading cards in that one year because I got involved with News Limited newspapers giving away samples. They put $200,000 worth of TV on every time that they would put the cards out through their paper on the Sunday. They'd give me half a page on the front page and they'd distribute all the cards to all the drugstores around Australia. We went from $2 million to $12 million in one season just with the football cards. Wow. I paid all the money back to my creditors within that 12 months. And then after that, I ended up selling the business not long after that because I promised my wife that I would not let anyone else put our house at risk. Yeah. At least if I made the mistake, I'd wear it. But to have a staff member do it, I wouldn't. So that's why I, I brought the business back to what it is now, marketing consultancy. Yeah. But, but can I say this to you? At the end of that, I had to keep my promise to go upstairs. And so therefore, I said to Gail, my wife, can I just have six months off before I get back into doing whatever? Because we sold the business for more money than we ever hoped because obviously when it was very successful, everyone wanted to talk to me. And so I, she said yes. So I went out and produced a TV program called Dreams Can Come True yeah. for the Channel 10 network here in Australia. And it ran on Sunday nights up against 60 Minutes and beat them in the ratings. Yeah. And what it was was delivering dreams for needy people who were down on their luck. And it was a wonderful six months of my period. Um, we ended up producing a number of these one-hour TV shows. And uh, just if I could do that all over again, I'd do it yeah. tomorrow. What were some of your favorites? I have actually watched a few of them. They're phenomenal. Yeah. Which were your yeah. favorites? Well, look, uh, the TV network said to us, as much and all as that they could see that it was very nice to make people's dreams come true, we had to have a celebrity element. Yeah. That wasn't part of my plan to start with, but I realized that for ratings, that's what we had to do. So there was one wonderful story that involved Michael Jordan, a little 15-year-old wheelchair mm. basketball. I'm in Chicago, by the way, yeah. Oh, you're in Chicago? Well, of yep. course, you know the Michael Jordan restaurant. Yep. Um, this little boy called Jay Campbell, he was uh, 15 years of age. In fact, 
just on 15. He actually met Michael Jordan on his 15th birthday. And this little boy tried to kill himself the year before. Oh, wow. And the local uh, minister uh, contacted us because we put the word out to the Starlight Foundation and Make-A-Wish Foundation and you know, all the churches. And this particular minister said, look, this uh, little boy would be a perfect for your TV show, Dreams Can Come True, because 12 months ago he tried to kill himself because he suffers from spina bifida. And he just didn't see life was holding much for him. And so, therefore, he was down in the dumps, and that's what happened. And fortunately, he didn't uh, kill himself, and uh, he took up wheelchair basketball. And he said, you wouldn't believe that. Talk about uh, uh, turning your life around. Um, this little boy on a normal wheelchair, not even a sports wheelchair, had become a member of the Australian under-16s wheelchair basketball team. And if they scored 50 points, he scored 40. Wow. Okay, he was just a whiz. And his name was Jay, and we actually visited him at the um, uh, at one of his games, whereby he was playing in this particular game. And he thought we were just doing a documentary on wheelchair basketball. We weren't. We were producing a, a story for this one-hour special. Yeah. And uh, as it turned out, we surprised him on that particular game. At the end of the game, when he's just sitting with all of his other team players in a row, we had a dolly track in front of him, and the cameraman stops in front of him, and his coach is reading from the platform and his coach says that all of you people who are playing wheelchair sport are an inspiration to us, but there's one in particular here uh, who's only 15 years of age who dreams for one day watching Michael Jordan play basketball. He just dreams of that day, but his parents have spent all their money on him and they don't have the wherewithal to do that. Right. We've got some news for you. Now, the camera stopped in front of his face and there's tears rolling down his face because he knows it must be him. And he said, uh, Jay Campbell, you're off to Chicago next week with your father to watch wow. Michael Jordan play. It's amazing. Now, this was 95, by the way, so Michael Jordan was playing. As yeah. he wheels his wheelchair to the podium, the whole stadium has erupted and then there's a silence. And the coach says to him, if you're finding it hard to believe this, wait till you hear this. Um, you've got a luncheon invitation to have lunch with the biggest star on the planet, Michael Jordan, while well, the wow. entire stadium went nuts. Wow. How did I pull that off? Yeah. All I did when I got that dream, uh, it was back in the fax days prior to email, I sent a fax to Jordan's office and said, this is the story. Is there any chance that you could possibly get tickets to the game? And is there any chance you could meet him? When I got to Chicago and we pulled this dream off and we took the little boy to the Michael Jordan restaurant in Chicago, Michael Jordan took him to lunch. Wow. And I said to Michael Jordan, how did our fax get through the two million that you get every week? And he said, I happened to be walking past the machine, which I only do, I only call into the office once every three or four weeks. I was walking past the fax machine when your letter came out. He said, I just happened to pick it up and saw that you were from Australia and what a wonderful story this was. And he said, mm -hmm. I gave it to Susan, my secretary, and said, make this happen. Wow. That's unbelievable. So no, no one can can convince me that the big guy upstairs did not help me make that happen. I wanted to pay back. And I won't bore you with the other stories, but we had Princess yeah. Di do the same thing and Meatloaf and the X-Files people and uh, a lot of big star, Paul Hogan, the Crocodile Dundee. We had all of these people help us deliver these unbelievable dreams of people who didn't have homes had got a home, people who needed yeah. transport, got a brand new car, uh, family reunions from you know, sisters that they hadn't seen for 20 years, and all these wonderful things. And you know what it proved to me, Jeremy, is that despite the fact that we hear all of this bad news on TV and online at the moment, do you know that 98% of people out there are wonderful, giving people, but unfortunately the media just doesn't give them the column centimetres that they deserve? Yeah. There's not one person we asked to do something that never said yes, not one. Not one, every, whether it was Sylvester Stallone, Steven Spielberg, or whether it was the butcher or baker down the street, or it was a home builder where we needed a home, yeah. every single person, when we told them the story of this person being in need and they needed a new car or they needed money for an operation or they needed their house rebuilt, every single person, celebrity or otherwise, otherwise said, yes, we're going to make this dream come true. So mm. i got to tell you, my lowest point in life ended up being one of my highs. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That is truly amazing. And uh, I'll have to link those videos up too. JD, I appreciate your time. I have one last question, but first tell people where they can find you. What do you have going on? What program should they check out? Thank you, mate. Thank you. Um, well, it's very kind of you to give me the opportunity to do that. Um, what I'd uh, like everybody to do is just get a whole bundle of cash and put it in a brown paper bag. <laughs> and if they could send it to this post office. But, um, okay. Uh, what's the, mate, what's the post office? No. <laughs> Um, very simple, mate. The website is theinstituteofwow.com. So mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to remember, theinstituteofwow.com. Mm -hmm. And look, uh, I've just launched a brand new thing that I think everyone would love, and it's a six-week video training series on that Wheel of Wow. And uh, I've called it the Phenomena Program. 
so therefore, if they go to my uh, website, uh, they'll see details of that. It's basically a, a product which they can buy for, I think it's under $1,000. I think it's 900 and something dollars. And what happens is that in their inbox, every Monday morning, they will receive a link to a one-hour video of me training them through that Wheel of Wow formula with lots of case studies. And obviously on this particular call, we couldn't show the menopause ladies before and after brochure and we couldn't see the fun parks before and after TV commercial. Yeah. But that's We'll all link part it up at you know, the instituteofwow.com backslash case dash studies. People can check out um, that those some of those images. Great. Oh, yeah. well, look, I didn't realize that you could do that. So that's great, yeah. Jeremy. But, um, yeah, so look, the Institute of wow.com and it's all there. And uh, the great thing about the video series, I know I'm going on about that, um, but the thing is, is that that's something they can start immediately. And basically, mm -hmm. uh, every Monday morning in their inbox, they'll have a, uh, a link and that link would give them a one hour uh, tutorial video. Pretty much like this. It's a bit cheeky. It's not too formal. Um, so yeah. I think that they'd probably find, hopefully they found it enter training, not just training. Yes. So, yeah, everyone should check out the Institute of WOW, and you, there's a lot of great resources, free and paid, which are all valuable. Um, and last question, JD, is what should we leave people with? Do you have um, some, where should they start, and do you have a good uh, final story, because you have so many good stories? Yeah, look, I, I um, just a couple of things, uh, Jeremy. I normally say to people when I'm doing a seminar presentation, do you think you need a good product? To make money and <clears throat> the reason i'm saying this is because a lot of people listening or watching this will be saying oh yeah look i don't have a wheelbarrow that lights up in the dark you know i don't have an iphone i don't have a rubik's cube what there's nothing particularly different about my product um and that's where this wow factor you know artificial wow factor stuff comes in because at the end of the day the toy sells a lot of those mcdonald's happy meal uh, boxes uh and when i say to everyone do you think you need a good product to make money they all go oh yeah 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 i said no you don't who thinks McDonald's makes the best hamburger in the world? Right. Nobody. But they just sold $24 billion worth of hamburgers in North America last year. And so that demonstrates that you don't need a good product. What you need is a good marketing system. And a lot of people say to me, oh, no, but a good operation system. I said, no, no, no. McDonald's have got a great operation system behind that counter. But if they didn't have people coming into the restaurant, there's no good having that. Okay, so therefore, it's the marketing system. That's what you've got to have is the good marketing system. And so my view and my advice to anyone watching this is that, you know, even if you don't think your product is the best in town, don't be too concerned about that. I mean, it's great if you've got a good product and good marketing, e.g. Disneyland, but if you don't have a product which you think is a, is a world beater, then don't be too fussed about that. It's all about the marketing. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that anyone should try and market a bad product. I'm not. But if you don't have a product that is the Rubik's Cube and you're worried about that, you sort of run on the mill, fine. Because what you can do is if you implement, well, a marketing system, obviously I'm going to vote for my Wheel of Wow version, but if you implement a proper marketing system, then of course it can still save that product and make you a lot of money. And the second thing I would suggest to anyone is hang around nuts. Okay. And Jeremy, it looks like, sounds and looks like another nut to me. So hang around him. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is because um, you want to hang around people who say uh, why not, not people who say why. Because at this age, I've decided not to hang around the whys anymore. Because, you yeah. know, I'd come up, I'm an ideas person, so I'd say, what about this, what about that, what about that, what about that, what about an underwater restaurant, what about we do this, what? And I'd get these, you know, accountancy style people around the table, oh, why, why? And yeah. every now and again, when someone with an X factor will say, why not? I'll go, bang, you're going to be on my supplier list. So generally, I believe, yeah. hang around with why nots. And then the last thing would be, be the un of your industry. And that means be unusual or unlike. So just don't be like everyone else. When you're thinking through that you're a pharmacy or you're a butcher or baker or candlestick maker, think about what makes you the un, as in unlike everyone else. Yeah. JD, thank you so much. This has been hugely valuable, an absolute pleasure. I uh, really appreciate it. My pleasure, mate. It's been a real uh, buzz to me too. It's fantastic. And uh, if ever I'm in Chicago in the near future, then we'll have a beer or two. For sure, definitely. So, did, did you have you you have had a beer or two in your life, haven't you? A few, yeah. Okay. I don't think I can uh, out drink you though. <laughs> happy reputation. I'm not too bad, but uh, Steve Plummer, who introduced me to you, well, he's got a problem. Yes, well, I'll talk to him about that. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All the best, mate.